<laughs> All right. So, hello everyone. Th uh, thank you very much for uh, finding time in your busy schedules to attend this uh, talk today. And yeah, as you may notice, uh, it's a talk about MongoDB. So, uh, today, MongoDB. Uh, what do you think we will be talking about? What are your expectations from today? I'm very curious about your expectations. I will find out what is going to be. That's a good expectation. Any other expectations? Live shows, huh? Live shows. <laughs> yeah? Okay, good. Can we see Hulk in action? Like Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe next time. Performance issues. <laughs> Performance issues. All right. Okay, so the expectation uh, is just one. I wanted to say that they vary, but uh, it's just one. So, uh, okay, so let's uh, begin with a little bit of ground setting. So MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB is a fancy term that now mm, many people use, but uh, actually where MongoDB fits and where does it start? So uh, MongoDB is a database for those of you who don't know, DB is a database. So uh, about databases, where it all started? Well, a few years ago in the 70s where the world uh, was black and white, uh, <laughs> then uh, Basically, SQL databases were introduced. Now, SQL is structured query language, which is a language that uh, basically was designed for uh, people to be able to grab data and to do this by um, expressing themselves as humanly as possible. So uh, the query language was not the problem. The problem was actually the technology. So this is an early IBM uh, machine. Uh, and then basically in the 70s, the computers were a little bit like this. So uh, when you wanted to run a database, you had to have a computer and basically you would fill the database with data, relational data basically at the time only. So uh, data about uh, bookkeeping and record keeping and all sorts of keeping. Uh, and you would basically fill up a building with this thing. So what happens? Uh, or what happened when uh, you had so much data that uh, they couldn't fit anymore? Well, you should, of course, buy another building and uh, buy another computer to fill the building with. So uh, at the time, it was okay because only great companies were able to have great amounts of data and required great computing, which this one definitely is. But today the world is a slightly different place to be. So today we have smartphones and Internet of Things and uh, all sorts of uh, smart TVs and uh, other smart gadgets uh, that, uh, that uh, might came to mind. And basically uh, there is an estimation uh, that by 2020 in the world there will be 4 billion connected people. Now connected in any way, huh? Internet of Things kind of uh, thing or computers. Uh, there will be 25 million apps running by then uh, that will be basically generating uh, uh, 50 trillion gigabytes of data that for your information is roughly, uh, um, well, I'm not doing the math right now, but today uh, we, have, uh, <laughs> uh, we have basically somewhere around one eighth uh, of that size. So uh, if we say that 50 trillion gigabyte of data are actually 50 zettabytes, then uh, today the world is running with eight zettabytes of data. And of that eight zettabytes, actually the 90% were only generated in the past two years. So you can expect that there is an exponential growth of, uh, of the data that we need to store around the world. Now, uh, why did the world generate so much data in the past few years? Well, basically it's because of the startups, it's because of the new technologies, it's because the ubiquity of internet connection and the very cheap access to internet connection. Google and Facebook are doing their best efforts to connect uh, parts in the world that basically have no uh, fixed access. You may have known about the balloons that I think Facebook is doing or Google, I'm not sure right now. But uh, there are all sorts of effort to connect the world. Now, there are key aspects here in this data growth that basically uh, these startups that, that are uh, doing their thing, basically they start with a great idea, which may be small, but then they found it so great that they can scale up and offer it to the whole world because of this connectivity. 
offering an idea which is small and great to the whole world requires, of course, great scalability. So the scalability that we are talking today is not about one building with one database. It's really that we need to be everywhere in the world. Then uh, the storage is, is very cheap. So it is not a problem today to buy disk arrays and servers and all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, data storage in order to be able to fit all the data in. And then last but not least, if you want to do a startup or if you have an idea, you start small with a, let's say, minimum viable product uh, or a product that basically fits your needs uh, from the very beginning. But maybe you don't know your final uh, product or how it looks or what data it will take. So you require some flexibility at the very beginning. And that's exactly uh, where basically Mongo starts to help. So where does exactly Mongo fit in in this, uh, in this story? Well, first of all, is exactly the data flexibility. Now, Mongo features something that's called a flexible document model. For those who know uh, how normal uh, relational databases work, uh, it's no new story. But for those who don't, basically, you need to know that every database is composed by tables. And every table is somehow connected, or might be or not, uh, uh, might not be connected with other tables. Now, in order to do this, and in order, of course, to, uh, to be very efficient in this, you should only keep your data stored once per table. You don't want your name or your address be updated many, many times across the tables in your database. And that's called normalization of data. Now, normalization is okay if we need to talk about space efficiency on disks. So when the disks were really, really expensive, you need to be uh, you needed to be very aware of uh, of the space and of course they are okay in order to have your data absolutely clean but they are not okay if you need to join the tables and start calculating let's say across many tables uh, even very little things so that's where uh, mongodb uh, basically uh, uh, um, works with something called uh, basically json which is javascript object, object notation and it's basically only a description of an object. So it's not a description about some data like names and some data like addresses, but it's an object which is maybe user or maybe a product in an e-shop or e-commerce solution or something like that. So basically that's, that's the idea behind it. Now, because I promised you some live shows, uh, I was thinking about how to demonstrate this very easily. So, I was impersonating myself into a role of a startup. And basically the startup is about uh, maybe mm, keeping restaurant records, right? So I found a restaurant, I think it's okay. So I want to just uh, place it in my database and then create an application and show it to the whole world that that restaurant is okay, is uh, Gianluca's favorite restaurant. All right, now that's the idea. And now, how should I approach it? I don't know if I find the restaurant. Well, I know that there is an address. There is a restaurant name. <coughs> I want to place the GPS coordinates and maybe the type of the restaurant, right? So that's the thing that I want to place. Maybe in the future, I will find something else, but I don't know about it right now. So I don't need to design any specific thing up front. I just need to store my data. And that's exactly where this JSON uh, comes in. So this basically is how I describe my restaurant. You see, there's no table. It's just a description. You can imagine this like a, a, a bullet uh, list of, of things. It's only in brackets. That's the only thing. So you can see, you can very easily read. I have an address and the address is composed by a building, by some coordinates, by some street name, and of course, by a zip code. Then. Uh, there is borrow, so where, uh, in which quarter I find it, the type of cuisine, and some other data like some scoring. So this is my date, and I graded it. Yeah, it was kind of bad, but then next time it was good, okay, and it was it was better, and then it was great, but then the quality uh, just went down and so on. So that's the idea behind the JSON, behind the the object that I'm storing in MongoDB. So. Let's now have a look at MongoDB actually doing it. So what I will be showing you right now is how to set up a MongoDB repository from scratch. So I have a clean computer. I don't have anything installed on the, on the computer. 
uh, I will be creating a database. I will actually be importing some data uh, and then I will show it to you how it looks like when, when you really use it. Okay, so uh, let me just open up my computer here. Hope you can see it. All right. Okay, so basically there are a few things that I need to, uh, need to create up front. So first of all, I will open uh, this great editor. I hope you can all see it and read it. If not, I will just make it a little bit bigger. And then I will open uh, my disk so that you can see what actually is happening. All right, so let's start with going to my C drive. And what I want to do is to create my folder structure for my databases. So let's start off with just creating uh, my folder structure. So I've created now Mongo data, which is just a folder empty with data and with the name of the database that I've chosen to be <coughs> database A01. It's a very poetic name. So, and it's now empty. So I just created the folder structure. So let's keep this open. Now, uh, what I need to do, I installed Mongo as an empty uh, program. So it's just there in my computer, but it's not running. It's not doing anything. So I now need to start it and just start instructing it what to do. So first of all, I need to navigate to my, uh, to my folder where uh, Mongo uh, is actually sitting. So let me clean this up a little and then I'll go to uh, my Mongo binaries. And then I need to start Mongo basically. So uh, the thing is that Mongo is very easy to, to start and unlike, for instance, SQL Server, there is no GUI that comes with it. So there is no user interface that you can start clicking things around and, and doing stuff. So you need to work from the command line. Now, Mongo is working on some, some GUI uh, tools that will help you with this. But uh, for, the, for this moment, basically, it's only about the command line. So the thing that I now need to do is to start MongoD. This is a process that contains my data and I specify the, the path of my data on the port that I want to run it. So this port is pretty basic, it's the standard stuff. So, all right, <coughs> now Mongo is running and I will keep it running here in this window. So I, I'm not running it like a service. You can run it like a window service, so it's there and basically it's, it's hidden, but uh, I will now run it as uh, a console application here so I will keep this alive. Now you see that it created some basic data. And now let's try to connect very quickly to MongoDB. Uh, let me just go to my, uh, to my folder here. And then basically I will type in Mongo, which is my shell. And I can specify the port or I can leave it as the default one. And now I'm connected to Mongo. So this is my shell. So I will name it so that we really know this is a shell. And this is my MongoD. All right. So let me just reorganize this a little if I may. If I'm not, then let's keep like that. Uh, so what to do now? I will just show the DBs that I have there. And it's pretty much empty. There's only a local DB, which is internal DB for Mongo uh, to work. So that's it. I have an empty database running. What's next? Now I will close this database right now. And I will now need to import some of the data. So I have my JSON data about my restaurants. Now I have done my homework and I have written 25,000 roughly documents in a notepad. Huh? So I have done my homework and then I decided I needed some help. So I installed MongoDB. So I will now need to import all of those data. So I will use just a command that's Mongo import and it just tells me uh, what should I import and where. So let's go. Importing, it's 11 megs of data and here we go. So I have imported the data. I will now connect again to Mongo, show the DBs. And I imported actually uh, the data in the test database. So I will use the test, da uh, test database and I will just um, display my collections. And here we go. We have a collection of restaurants. And now if we do a DB restaurants count, then basically it should give me, uh, okay, what's the problem? Okay. Uh, oh yeah, count. 
So I have my 25,000 documents there, right? Okay, so that was how, let's say, difficult it was to run a MongoDB single instance to import the data and to just uh, verify my data out there. So pretty easy, right? Oops. So let's finalize this and yeah, uh, let's also have a look at some of the data. So we have two ways right now in MongoDB 3.2, which is the newest version of Mongo, how to visualize the data. I can definitely use my, uh, my uh, command line tool and I can use also something that's called MongoDB Compass. Now, I will start with this uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview. So uh, let me just um, use the test database and do a DB uh, uh, restaurants uh, find. And this will basically find me all the restaurants. Now, that isn't too, uh, too good. So uh, <coughs> it isn't too good because I don't see basically what, I, what I'm doing here and, I, and there are too many of them. So the first thing I can address by just making it pretty, right? So I now can see basically uh, my, my, uh, uh, my nice structure of the JSON. But the thing that I want to do is actually to find a concrete restaurant. And to do so, you can see that uh, I have my JSON object here. So I can query pretty much all of these things, uh, all of these JSON, um, JSON or, or uh, basically rows. Uh, so what I will do is that I will try to find a name, right? that has a value of cucina uh, fresca. Yeah. All right. And I will make, make it pretty. So here I found exactly one document about the restaurant cucina fresca. So this is exactly how I should query. There is no SQL. It's only JavaScript. Very easy. Okie okay, dokie, okay. so let's now look at the MongoDB compass and try to find or try to have a look at the data uh, that I have in the <coughs> database. Now let's try to connect. There we go. So I see my database is here, so my test database with my restaurants collection. So if I choose the restaurant collection, now the compass is analyzing the data. So it's sampling them because we only have 25,000 documents. It's easy for, um, uh, for a compass to go through it and basically do its uh, figuring out. But if you have millions and millions of documents, of course, it will take only a sample. And now there is a visual way of how to understand your data. So you can definitely see I have my ID, which is always there uh, with any MongoDB uh, JSON object. Then I have my address. And since, you know, we saw here that the address is basically created or uh, composed by some sub elements, then uh, I can basically open up the address and have a look at the sub elements. So building, cord, street, and zip code. And then I can also have a visual understanding of the data. So here I see that uh, my coordinates are basically all around the same place. So I don't have anything in Africa or somewhere, somewhere like that. Then I can do maybe also a selection of, uh, uh, of the data. So let's say I want to only display the, uh, the restaurants in Brooklyn. So apply. And I don't need to Im immediately know the, the query language of Mongo, but I can still visually analyze the data here in this tool. So this is also one way how to approach data analysis and basically understanding uh, of, the, of the thing that I have in Mongo. All right. So... Uh, let me get back to the presentation, which I've closed. So I need to open it again. Uh, okay. So we basically ended up here. So what's next? Now we said that we have a very flexible data model. As soon as we have the data stored in Mongo and we want to go ahead with our project, we want to uh, go to the world and be super famous, we need to be able to scale. So scaling is the next thing that MongoDB actually helps uh, addressing. Now, for those of you, including me, who tried to scale out a SQL database, it basically felt a little bit like this, you know? So it wasn't really... 
it wasn't really that easy. And that's it, that because the SQL databases like, Mon like uh, SQL Server and Oracle and Teradata, they are very powerful engines and they are very focused on doing their thing, but they also have many, many features around it. So they have reporting and uh, optimization and, and querying and data analysis and whatnot. So in order to be able to scale, you have to have features, of course, to, to be uh, appealing for the customer, but you, you can't have that many features. And so that's exactly where Mongo fits. So let's have a look at, the, at this uh, diagram where we basically have features and, uh, and uh, speed or ease of scale. So on one end, we have something that's really lightweight, like Memcached, which is a key value store database, and we can scale it basically to, to mega scale uh, kind of approach. Then on the other hand, we have super feature database like SQL Server, Teradata, Oracle. So what Mongo fits in to be appealing enough, but scalable enough. So somewhere in the middle. So let's now look at the architecture of Mongo. MongoDB is just a normal database like any other database. So in order to be able to communicate with Mongo, you have your application and your MongoDB driver. So the driver is just a library that allows you to communicate with Mongo. Mongo communicates over the so-called wire protocol, which is a proprietary protocol of MongoDB. So that's exactly where the driver uh, starts its, its job and do the communication. So you have the application, you have the driver, and then of course you have the database. Now, I have written primary here, or uh, basically this is uh, the primary data store where my reads and writes are performed. But I want to have my data secure because I invested really lots and lots of time into creating that, uh, uh, that uh, 25,000 restaurants in my, in my notepad. So uh, I don't want to lose it because I already deleted that notepad file. Uh, so I want to do a replication. And I can add as many replicas of my primary data as I want. So then when there is a problem with the primary, a secondary steps in, takes the role, and my service is basically continued quite easily. I don't have a problem with that. So, what's the next step? Well, of course, we need to try it. So, let's have a look at the database. And let's create basically a replica set out of that. <coughs> so, now I need to end my shell. I also need to end my uh, Mongo running. So, I will terminate Mongo. And I will need to start it with a new parameter, which is REPL set. And in the REPL set parameter, I will basically define my replica. So I decided to name the replica as uh, basically replica A. All right, so I will now start it. And it started, it's okay. But I also now need to start the two other uh, members. So it's two other databases that I now need to start. So what I will do is that I will open here a window and another one and let's call this uh, rename tab and let's call it uh, Mongo uh, or let's call it DB uh, A02 and uh, rename the tab and R. Uh, what ARB actually means, I will explain you. And let's also rename this tab to keep it consistent. So DBA01. So this is my primary actually running, or it's not a primary yet, but it's my only database running. So what I need to now do is basically to spin up the other twos. So let's go to my folder here. Oops, not that one. So let me just get that here. All right, and then the other one. Okay, so let's now spin the other twos as well. A very similar fashion. So I still am starting the one file, which is MongoD. I'm only telling it to run under, oh yeah, one thing I, I forgot. Uh, I'm only telling it to run uh, under a different port. And the thing that I forgot is actually to create my, uh, my folder structure. So I need to create my folders here so to accommodate the database. And let's do that. So, uh, so that actually uh, we have my, uh, we have the folders there. <coughs> so let's run it like that. And here we go. Here, here we have the folders. So uh, let me terminate that and basically rerun it. 
Here we go. So that's the second node running. And let's run also the third node. So what I've actually done right now is that I only spun up three databases. I didn't instruct them to talk together. So it's three standalone databases running on the same machine on three different ports. So let's now make them work together. So I will now log in to the one with the port uh, 27017. And I will now need to configure my uh, replica set. And to do that, I will use nothing else than JSON. Uh, so I will now create uh, basically a configuration document. I have defined a variable named CFG, it can be any variable, it doesn't matter. And then in CFG, I said, please just create a replica with the name replica A, where I have three members. One is this one, which is the name of my local machine with a port, the other one and the third one. And with the third one, there's arbiter only. Now, MongoDB is a leader-based system. A leader-based system means that in order to, uh, you remember the, the picture, so in order to uh, elect a new primary, in case of the old primary was failing, there has to be an election. And every machine in the replica set has a vote, or a vote right, or a right to vote. So uh, I need to have the majority of votes in order to be able to elect my new primary. If I only had two machines, then I could never ever achieve the majority of votes because I could only achieve 50% if I had the failure of the primary. That's why I need to have an odd number of machines in this case, or basically any number of machines that is uh, able to create a majority in voting. So that's why I'm adding the arbiter. So the arbiter is not containing any data, it's just there to vote. Okay, so now I created my, uh, my configuration document. Let's now uh, initiate my replica set. So uh, initiate and my configuration will be passed as a parameter. And here we go. So it says, okay, possibly. And you see other. So now the, uh, the member of the replica set doesn't know if it's a primary or a secondary. So there is an election going on. And now I know it's a secondary and now I know it's a primary. So now I can read and write. From the secondary, I can only read, but only if I explicitly say, okay, let us just have a look. So when I do um, our query of finding the restaurant, so that's Cucina Fresca, I will return uh, or uh, I will see my query being uh, performed quite, um, quite without problems. Now, if I connect to the other replica set uh, member, so port 27018, then this is a secondary, you see, and if I do the same query again, it will just tell me, ah, no, I will not give you the data. That's because the replication is going on behind the scenes. So if I want to have my data in Mongo and I want to be able to rely on those data just by reading them, MongoDB needs to ensure the data are on that node. So it cannot ensure it if it's replicating those data, because there can be a lag, there can be a downtime, there can be whatever. So it tells you by default, I will not give you the data from the secondary unless you explicitly tell me that you are okay with slaves or, or some sort of uh, information like that. So slave, okay. So then when I pass this information in, I can redo my query. And now here we go. Because I'm telling Mongo that I'm fine with having eventually consistent data. So for my reporting, it's fine. If I wanted to do something like a user change his password and I immediately want to log him in, reading from another member of the replica set and the password isn't changed, then I'm giving him stale data and that's not okay. All right, so by the way, you have seen primary, now secondary and all of the data are replicated in uh, in basically immediately, all those 50,000 documents. All right. So let's move on. If we want to be a little bit more sophisticated, then we cannot only rely on one database physically being bound to one server. So we said there is a replica and replica set and replica set members going on. But those replicas 
are only containing the same data of the primary. So what if I expand my database so it no longer fits into that primary? Well, I need to, I need to scale it out. I need to shard it. I need to put it on other servers, not only on one. And that's exactly the second thing that we can do with Mongo. So I'm now connecting my application with the driver, not directly to Mongo, but to some load balancing layer. And this can be one or it can be many. So I'm asking MongoDB as my entity, as my, as my thing, to give me the data. And I'm not really interesting where, uh, interested where the data really are. I'm just telling the router, hey, find me the data about Cucina Fresca and just give them back to me. And then the query router needs to figure out, okay, where they are because it can be connected to a multitude of data bearing servers. So this is basically one of the primaries that I have, and this is another one, and this is another one, and this is another one. So all of these primaries are able to read and write. All of those are basically the, the good ones. But the thing is that uh, everyone contain a different portion of the data. So let's say that I want to have uh, maybe, you know, Cucina Fresca, which maybe starts from C. So alphabetically, it will go maybe A, B, C, D, E, uh, yeah, and so on. So, <laughs> so uh, it will just find it in my first chart because I instructed MongoDB that I want to shard based on the database and I want to just uh, uh, make or uh, keep these um, A, B to C here on this server. All right, and what happens if there is a failure on this server? The full shard is broken because of course the server cannot, can no longer function if uh, it cannot read and write all of the primaries. So a very easy step, as you might imagine, is to add a bunch of other servers. So uh, I can add as many secondaries as I want. Well, there's a limit. There's 50 secondaries that you can add per primary. But uh, this is the logic when, if I want to really, really scale out, the uh, probability of a server going down is quite high. So the probability of one server going down is okay, but maybe the probability that I will have a failure in my uh, server <coughs> network uh, on one machine <coughs> is pretty high especially if I run it on uh, commodity hardware, which basically MongoDB was especially designed for. So no special machines and, and stuff like that. So that's the reason why I want to add my secondary. So if I have a, a failure on the primary, this is still replicated so the secondary can step in and take over. Guess what? Let's have a look. So let's create a bunch of servers. <laughs> Uh, so let me just uh, go back to here and if I manage to I will now create again my folder structure not to forget about that here we go <coughs> so what I've done is that basically what I want to create right now is one and a second uh, branch of shards right so that's why i created uh, this kind of logic so i have dba1 and dba2 representing the databases for my first shard with an arbiter a representing the arbiter and then db uh, b1 and db b2 and arbiter uh, b basically to create my second then you you see that there are a few other folders here with which is config servers now config servers are there for the uh, query routers to understand where all the data are. So they are basically the, uh, the keepers of the information, which shard contains which data. So it's very easy for the Mongo S or uh, the query router, sorry, to, to access those data. All right, so let's now clear this and let's start uh, basically creating uh, the servers. So I will now create my config instances. Let's start with that one. So uh, one and two and three. So rename and let's uh, name it conf or CFG01 uh, and CFG02 and basically CFG03. Uh, <coughs> okay. okay. Let's navigate to, uh, oops, okay, uh, wrong thing to do. 
So let's navigate to here and hopefully it will. Here we go. And now let's start creating uh, the config servers. So it's the same process as with the data bearing nodes. The only thing that I'm passing here is that I'm creating a config server so that uh, MongoDB uh, really knows that uh, this server is only meant to be a config server. So uh, in its internal logic, it basically uh, knows. Okay. So now we have three config servers running. Again, these are three standalone config servers. Since we have this very good option of creating uh, um, replicated uh, members, then we also need to create a replica of the config servers. Because if my config server fails and the query router is not able to take the data from the config server, I can no longer access uh, my data. So I want to have this, uh, uh, these config servers really resilient. So what I will now do, is that I need to connect to my uh, Mongo with uh, the, queer, uh, the uh, config server. So I will just uh, do that. First of all, let me clean it up. And then uh, I'm connecting through this port, which is basically one of these config servers, actually this one. Okay, and then basically it's the, again the same thing. So I need to create my configuration document saying, uh, hey, there are a bunch of servers that I want to create a, a replica set of. Then I need to initiate the replica set and then uh, tells me, okay, other, secondary, I'm fine with that. So I now have my config servers uh, done. So what next? Now we need to add the shard. So I only have my replicated uh, data bearing nodes in my, in my first, uh, in my first uh, DBA01 and DBA02 uh, replica set. And I, I need to instruct Mongo to take this replica set and create a shard out of it. So let's do exactly that. Uh, so let us connect first to the config server. Uh, oops, again, wrong thing. Sometimes it doesn't do the right job. It still doesn't. There we go. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think the third one is named wrong. Is it? The third config server. So it's CG instead of CFG. Okay, that was a mess. Let me just try again one thing. Ah. Um, yes. Uh, you had an incorrect IP address. Did I? I think uh, uh, not the IP address port. In that command line you used uh, at the end 217, but uh, you had the 117. Oh, yes. Eagle-eyed, <coughs> eagle-eyed. <laughs> so let me just... It's really weird. Two seven one seventeen. What I'm connecting and it's to? You have two hundred seventeen. Two seven. Okay. Okay. Let me just check if I didn't skip anything. Mm -hmm. Two hundred one seventeen. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I know, I forgot to start the query router. That's the thing. Didn't you know? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start the query router as well, which is exactly, we started the config servers, but we didn't start the query router, which I was trying to connect to. And that was the main problem. 
because of course I need to run the query over first. So nevertheless, CD uh, program files or C actually uh, program files and then MongoDB and then bin or server and bin and there we go and then just draw it here and sure. <laughs> okay. okay now let's start this mm -hmm. chunk size one did I say okay right so hopefully now I will be able to connect to this Mongo S. Yeah, and I'm connected, right. So all went well. Uh, then now I need to add the first chart. So that's the thing that I'm going to do. So now I'm <coughs> instructing MongoDB to add my replica A as my first shard. So now it's added as a shard and now I need to basically instruct uh, MongoDB or I can do it later that basically I want to shard the database because even if I add the shard like that, it doesn't mean that it automatically starts to shard across the databases. I explicitly need to say to MongoDB to do so because otherwise I can still keep my own separation between the shards. So I can specify that a database will be running on shard A and another database completely will run on shard B and then I'm able to, let's say, have full control over where I want to have all the databases. But I don't want that. I want my one database to span, to be uh, basically uh, spanning across uh, two shards in this case. But uh, let's uh, return to that later now. Let's spin up the second shard so that we can really go ahead and, and start to shard the database. So uh, let's, in fact, add another bunch of servers. So uh, let me add one, two, and three. And basically, I will now name them uh, as uh, DBB01. Uh, and dbb02 and dbb03 uh, arb b okay now uh, let's let's do this two and three good basically it's still the same task all over again uh, so we are only creating other and other replicas. So this is actually the third, and I can promise you is the last replica set that we are creating. But it is definitely needed in order to achieve perfection. Good, so here we go. Uh, three databases running. Now we also need to instruct these three databases to become uh, a replica uh, set. So let's go back to the shell. Uh, let's go away from here and let's uh, actually connect to uh, to the port uh, three. There we go. And then configure here my document. There we go. And RS initiate. CFG. There we go. So we have now the last replica running. So now we can instruct again uh, basically the Mongo S to add the second shard. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Now. Okay, so now I have my two branches shard or, uh, attached to the Mongo S, to the query router. So MongoDB now knows it has two shards. It still doesn't know it should shard between these two databases. So we need to enable sharding on our database test. So let's enable sharding. And then we also need to enable sharding on the collection itself. Because we still can, um, we we still can uh, have a, a database sharded, but without sharded collections. 
So in fact, let's just shard the collection. And in order to shard the collection, uh, I basically told you about um, my decision as an administrator to have it sharded based on the alphabet or, or the name uh, alphabet, uh, alphabetically sorted. So in order to do that, I need to create an index. And that index actually works as a so-called shard key. So I need to create a shard key based on that index. So I need to create that index first. So uh, let us create that index on the name field. So now it says, yes, it has been created. So now we can even start sharding our collection based on this very shard key. Now, the, the thing that is most difficult uh, for running advanced deployments of MongoDB is to exactly figure out how your data are being used, where they are being created, where they are being read, and how they are being distributed. So if, if you have a distribution that's quite even, like data from sensors, uh, it's very easy just to create a hash value on the ID and the data are being uh, uh, basically uh, written and uh, read uh, basically randomly across your uh, servers. But if you want to have things like geolocation factored in, or if you want to have things like uh, like maybe a distribution which is not normal, but it's slightly off-centric uh, then uh, or off-center, you need to be able to determine the right shard key in order not to have some shards of your uh, database overloaded and some other shards just doing nothing. So that's uh, sometimes a problem and basically if you define a shard key in the wrong way uh, then you're done so uh, let's now have a look at the db stats uh, to just understand what's going on with our database so uh, the db stats actually tells me that uh, oh i just forgot to do one thing uh, or did i not Collections. No, I didn't. So uh, basically, it just tells me that I have uh, one collection in my database test, which is right. I have only uh, the collection of restaurants. I have two indexes. There is always a default index on the ID value, and there is my index that I have just created with uh, the uh, with the name uh, in mind. And then uh, yes, I have my average object size and all sorts of information, which is fine. Uh, and then I also want to understand how my database is sharded. So uh, let's have a look at that. So I want to understand if the sharding is still going on or if it's, if it's uh, finalized. And now I can see basically that uh, my sharding is finished uh, because I have reached an almost 50 to 50% 50 ratio of distribution of something called chunks, which is an internal a uh, piece of data that MongoDB moves around. So now I have 50% of data on my first uh, shard and 50% of data on my second shard. So I can now add as, as many shards as I want and MongoDB on its own will take place to redistribute my data. So uh, as a consumer of the MongoDB database, if I start to run to a limit of my MongoDB installation, I can just add new and new servers and I don't need to do pretty much anything else. All right, so I have a question. go ahead. You said that the primary index is based on your ID. Yes. I can see that your prepared ID is in your JSON at your homework in the node file. Yes. But so, it's fine because it's just an export from another database. Yes, so if you import... Uh, uh, yeah, my question is heading there. Yeah. Is it me as a, as a developer or somebody, uh, database admin, who gives IDs or does this MongoDB do for me? So that's a good question. It's both. Because uh, if you don't specify the underscore ID field, then MongoDB creates it for you. It's a mandatory field to be there, so it will create it for you. If you want to keep your uh, IDs uh, in MongoDB under your control, you can put any value you want. So let's say that you have some IDs that you want to use with your other systems that are uh, you know, using that, you can specify that. Usually best practice is to keep those IDs like the Mongo IDs and then to create another value with your own IDs so that you can have full control over those. So I can keep it on Mongo? You can keep it on And then it can go across all the shards. And it can yes. And everything. Yes. And yes. I don't have to pay. No. Okay. So, 
I call that that we have created basically three and other three and other three and other three that uh, I think it's 12 servers together on one machine pretty much in how much 20 minutes uh, good scaling huh? so uh, <laughs> I will now talk about the eco economy so uh, MongoDB uh, has of course all nice features uh, that uh, mean that uh, basically is very well usable for developers it's very uh, easily deployable, it's very lightweight, and uh, it also features some interesting, uh, interesting functionalities on its own. Uh, but there's more to that. Why should I, as a company, think about MongoDB as my technology of choice? So uh, there are a few cases here that uh, I found pretty interesting. So Otto, for instance, is a German uh, fashion and lifestyle products retailer with a turnover of uh, 28 billion, uh, or sorry, uh, yeah, 28, uh, bi uh, sorry, 2 billion uh, euro uh, per year. And basically what they have done is that uh, they offer pretty much a very broad catalog of products. And uh, they, or it took for them uh, roughly 12 hours every day to update the catalog with uh, new products and descriptions and everything. So it was really it was really slow and painful and they wanted to use the data also for personalization and some, some other features. So what they basically have done is that uh, they exactly forgot about the standard a relational uh, database uh, approach where many many tables across many products and many variants and many other uh, other uh, basically specifics that they need to update needed to be updated and then uh, they turned to uh, use mongodb with the json object so now uh, the uh, the updating of uh, the catalog instead of 12 hours is basically down to 15 minutes so it's just because of using this other approach. So MongoDB helped them in, in, the, in, the, fast of, in, in the speed of updating the catalog. Uh, also, uh, basically, um, with the flexibility of the data model, it allowed them to store even more information that they were bound to use just by technology before. So they can uh, use or store basically uh, additional marketing information and, uh, and things that they can use for uh, the, uh, actually the, the product, product presentation online. Uh, they also uh, basically uh, uh, lowered the speed of reads, so they can now go very, very uh, fast on reads. And actually, they scaled up to 800 page impressions per second. And uh, those 800 page impressions per second generate 10,000 oh, oh, 10, events per second. And all of that is actually being uh, real life um, uh, supported by MongoDB. Every click, what basically they record, they're recording MongoDB so that they can run uh, advanced analytics on it. Okay, the, the other thing that I found really interesting, which is sort of similar, is Gap. Now, Gap uh, used uh, MongoDB to power uh, their uh, purchase ordering system. They created their own purchase ordering system, which uh, is created entirely on a microservices basis. And they use basically MongoDB uh, in, um, in uh, powering also the data of, um, uh, of this purchase ordering system. Uh, the key information with this case is that um, uh, their business people were actually evolving on some ideas and they needed IT and their uh, systems uh, division to basically keep up with uh, their evolution of ideas. So imagine designing database schemas to be very flexible in supporting, hey, let's try that or uh, let's try that one and uh, let's change it dynamically. It just isn't, isn't possible. So uh, they basically created a data store based on MongoDB so that they can really uh, iterate quickly and follow up on uh, the ideas of business. So uh, the other one is Expedia. Expedia is a portal where you can buy travels and what they have created is something called a scratch bed. Now in the scratch bed you can basically plan your vacation including buying tickets, including going to hotels and restaurants. And there are some people who prefer starting from a cheap flight ticket. There are some people who prefer starting from a good destination to go. And there are some people who just don't care. And you have these three uh, basically uh, main uh, scenarios that you want to support in the, in the scratch pad. So again, you don't know upfront 
uh, what kind of information you need to store. And you want to evolve quickly on this product, which actually allows also to very well understand the customers of Expedia and then use the data to again personalize on the offers that Expedia uh, offers to the customers. And then the last thing is MetLife. MetLife is uh, an insurance company and they basically faced the problem that they had too many systems uh, containing too <laughs> many siloed information. So, or too much uh, siloed information. So they actually have uh, 70 plus systems with customer information, uh, records about uh, the um, insurance um, um, events that, uh, that went there and some other information that basically they wanted to consolidate for their sales to be able to understand what's going on and to be able to quickly react. So they basically uh, created a working prototype in two weeks of this consolidation and they were able to go live in three months with a productive uh, implementation of this, uh, of this product. And they basically store now 50 million policies uh, uh, in, for 118 million customers and basically all of this creates uh, 190 million of those JSON documents. All of that again running in, uh, on MongoDB. MongoDB out of the box or uh, like that comes as an open source system. So you can definitely start for free. And if you feel it, it basically is the full featured MongoDB that you can get if you uh, buy the enterprise version. So all the scaling, all the indexing, all the uh, performance uh, improvements and all of the stuff is there out of the box. The only thing that you don't get is some advanced security. So if you want to place your uh, MongoDB into an LDAP or uh, use it with LDAP users or uh, use the Compass, which is really something that is aimed for uh, application operation divisions and so on, then you need to aim for the enterprise version, which will always uh, offer you as well some uh, professional services and support. So that's the, that's, the, um, that's the version that you want to go for if you go uh, with enterprise. Okay, so from me, that's pretty much all. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I will try to answer. I have a question when it comes to relations between data. Mm -hmm. What is the usual, usual approach with this? So, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, not just the perspective that I can introduce some part of JSON to, to uh, give the shared information, how to incorporate it, but how will this go with the flexible data structure? Mm -hmm. That in the beginning of the day I had these restaurants, but during the day I, I decide to add into some particular restaurants some additional information. Mm -hmm. Then I have some business logic mm -hmm. relying on having this information there, and suddenly it comes that half of my data has this information, half not. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me divide this question too. Uh, first of all, uh, basically is the, is the uh, relations. So if you want to, if you want to keep uh, your uh, data split into collections, maybe one collection is users and the other collection may be restaurants. And maybe you want at some point to connect users and restaurants to say uh, a user or a particular user has visited these restaurants, then you can still approach it very much like in the relational database with foreign keys that for a user you will start to create basically sub uh, documents saying visited restaurant ID and then you link it. You need to take care about this in the application. So when you are developing the application you need to count with this from the beginning. MongoDB 3.2 which is the newest version introduces uh, joins. So before you really needed to join in the application itself which uh, in SQL world is a, uh, is a counter pattern or is a bad pattern to follow. But in, in MongoDB, it was native. Uh, so now what MongoDB can do for you is that it can create a join. So it can basically on an ID or on the foreign key, it can embed another document in, in the main document that you are querying. So if you, for instance, want to, uh, Again, users and restaurants, if you, for instance, want to create a web page where you just want to do one call to the database, fetching the whole object for the whole page, you would ask MongoDB to insert basically some, maybe, or all the data of the restaurants in that user uh, document. So it will come with it. And then the second uh, question was related to the uh, expanding of the document model. 
I guess you are asking uh, this because you refer also to indexing, not only maybe to the application. So in MongoDB, we have something called the sparse index. The sparse index is, is basically an index that goes through uh, your documents based on the field name that you have specified, like I've specified name. And if it finds the document, it will index it. If it doesn't or the value is null, then it will skip it. It will not break. Uh, and regarding the uh, the fact that you might or might not have the document in place, well, you need to take care about that in the in the application. So do a null check. Is it a relational level close to my application? Yes, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Those were good, by the way. So uh, myself, uh, uh, or I myself, didn't do a one-to-one -one comparison, but uh, let's let's follow it like this. Uh, if I have a very big and uh, expanded database or database uh, relational database expanded across many tables, mm -hmm. and I would do an update of a document that will hit those many tables, I would really need to go and do that update on all the tables. In MongoDB, I would do a query to find the ID, uh, based on the ID that I'm, uh, I'm working on, of that document, and I would only update that one document. So the granularity of update is really smaller, which if you have a database with one immense table, which only contains uh, uh, thousands of thousands of thousands uh, rows, then I don't know if the benefit is so visible. Uh, but of course, if you are starting to uh, talk about expanded database, then uh, MongoDB, if you designed it correctly, uh, it is really, really much faster. So can you explain when it's not faster? Because I assume the, this kind of database is not useful for every case, like especially if you have a huge table with always the same data. Yeah, so if you want to, uh, if you want to do like bookkeeping, or uh, things that are really relational by nature, then uh, you are really better off with a relational database because you design the schema once and that's it. And you basically just fill it with data up to, uh, up to its full. Uh, some of the databases have options uh, or the SQL databases have the option to scale out, but then there is always, always a trade-off that uh, maybe you can read from some of the databases, but you can't write. So this is, for instance, with SQL Server with the always on high availability groups. Uh, or if you want to write, then uh, um, you need to start thinking about really physically putting the data in databases and you need to start or you st uh, uh, yeah, need to start thinking about really splitting the data based on the logic uh, that isn't taken care of by the server itself. So if you are fine with just writing the data and they fit into the database uh, with a scale up, not scale out kind of approach, then SQL is your choice. And of course, SQL is a choice if you know SQL very well and you need to rely on SQL. If you don't know SQL uh, and you don't care about SQL, then MongoDB offers this query language, which is okay uh, to use as JavaScript. But uh, MongoDB, again, 3.2, introduces something called the BI connector, which is basically a client that understands SQL and translates it to the MongoDB language. But that is very well usable only for BI purposes like uh, Power BI or ClickView or Tableau to extract the data and show them somehow on a chart. Yeah. Come on, boys and girls. I have another question. So yeah. um, <laughs> and I know you told me that uh, MongoDB is not the same as it was five years ago. Yeah. But, uh, as far as I remember, Mongo was really convenient in uh, using it uh, like for uh, for data, which doesn't always have the same structure. Mm -hmm. So using a case of, uh, of restaurants is not really a good example for me because you always have the same set of data, basically. You have location, you have name, you have uh, I don't know what. Mm -hmm. And then you can have other databases like with, uh, okay, this is uh, rating and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really convenient when you have, uh, for example, the Ulta example was good because you have several different products and each have, has different parameters. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to put them all in the same table, you would basically have to have empty cells uh, for, for where the parameters do not apply for the certain product. Mm -hmm. 
So why did you choose uh, restaurants as, as this example or did Mongo evolve so well that it's uh, actually better? Actually? Well, uh, in Mongo we can pretty much fit even a relational uh, or a data that we can think of as, as relational. So uh, it really doesn't matter if you choose relational or, or Mongo. Uh, and why I chose the restaurants? Because at any point in time, there can be an evolution. So maybe uh, you say, I now start to add Michelin stars, but I don't know for 20,000 or 25,000 restaurants, I don't have Michelin stars to be placed. <laughs> so uh, in a relational world, I would have out of 25,000 restaurants, uh, maybe five or maybe 10 with Michelin stars. So I, in relational, I would need to add a column with five values and 25,000 minus five, no values. And if I wanted to add something like that with, uh, for instance, uh, <laughs> then uh, I would run into the same problem. And if I wanted to maybe add comments on those restaurants, then I would start to collect even additional data from additional sources that I might shape in different ways. So maybe the comments would be name, surname, uh, email and comment. But then it, I could even add something like uh, a, a user rating, you know. So in that case, I really want to have the uh, possibility to expand my data very quickly without thinking about updating the database schema, maybe bringing the database down because of that and making my service unavailable. There's some possibility to do, uh, do something similar as dropping column in relational databases. So some quick way how to drop probably one of the attributes of the documents. You would need to delete it across the full database. So for every document, you would run a delete process. Uh -huh. So iteratively, yeah, it's not super fast. <laughs> So, I can answer that. Uh, because it was conceived as a database for big data, and they said, okay, so it's so big, it's so humongous, that we will call it Mongo. And this is true. <laughs> so, last one maybe? If not? Yeah. yeah? There's some limitation for uh, nesting objects to another object in the, in the database? Yeah, good question, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and on that bombshell, <laughs> thank you very much.